Welcome to tonight's city council meeting. The public can attend tonight's meeting in person at the George DeZero City and County Building Council Chambers located at One Decomb Drive or watch live on Channel 8 and through live streaming on Broomfield's website. The public may also participate in public comment either in person or by calling 855-695-3744 and pressing star 3 to be placed in the queue for comment. Please note that if you're calling in for public comment and would like to speak on more than one item on tonight's agenda, you'll need to press star 3 each time to be placed back in the queue for comment. Public comment will be limited to 90 minutes total per item. The first 1 through 15 participants in the queue have 3 minutes to speak. The next 16 through 25 have 2 minutes. And if time remains, the next 26 plus participants in the queue have 1 and a half minutes to speak. Again, if joining virtually for public comment, the number is 855-695-3744. And press star three to be placed in the queue. Screeners will ask callers for their first and last name, neighborhood, and the agenda item the caller would like to comment on. Please call several minutes before the agenda item and press star three to ensure you're in the queue for comment. If joining in person, we'll ask you to come up to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record. The City Council regular meeting is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Hinkle? Here. Kaczerski? Here. Leslie? Here. Lynn? Here. Lindstedt? Marsh Holshen? Here. Jack? Here. Ward? Here. Thank you. Quorum is present. Will everyone please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In an effort to keep order for tonight's meeting, I ask council members to limit their comments to five minutes. If council members are given an opportunity to speak for a second time, they should limit their comments to two minutes. The clerk will be assisting with timekeeping, and council members will be able to see their time on the podium. I will plan on a 10 minute break at approximately 8 p.m. We will begin with Council's review and approval of this evening's agenda. Council may add or remove items from the consent agenda or Council may revise the order of business for a meeting. Does any member of Council have any comments or questions regarding this evening's agenda? Are there any objections to this agenda being approved? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. The first item this evening under petitions and communications is a proclamation declaring May 15th, 2022 as National Peace Officers Memorial Day and May 15th through 22nd as National Police Week in the city and county of Peruvio. Will the representatives here to accept the proclamation please come and meet Mayor Pro Tem, well, there's lots of representatives, meet Mayor Pro Tem Tzersky at the podium. And will the representatives please introduce yourselves? Chief Ann Huffelman. Commander Nogi Gavis. Deputy Chief Roger Morgan. Deputy Chief Mark Adele. All right, now let's be all two. This proclamation honors and recognizes the crucial role the Broomfield Police Department plays in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of our community and protecting our residents against violence and disorder. We extend appreciation to Chief Hempelman and all of our law enforcement officers for the vital services they provide and their exemplary dedication to the Broomfield community. Therefore, as mayor, I hereby declare and proclaim May 15th to May 21st, 2022 as National Police Week in Broomfield, Colorado. Now we'll take public comments. Would anyone like to speak on this item? Starting with in person, no public online. All right. Comments and questions from council are next. Are there any council member questions? Council member Lindsay. Yes, I have a question. Um, 
Um, Chief, would you mind? I'd love to meet the other members of your team, not just the senior officers, <coughs> but could they swing by so we can recognize them, please? <laughs> Sergeant Gary Larson. Officer Brian again. <coughs> Sergeant Nicholas Wyman. Mm -hmm. Officer Sebastian DiMenedis. <laughs> Sergeant Fernando Ortiz. <coughs> Officer Luis Marson. <laughs> Officer John Skegan. <laughs> Sergeant Jason Collins. Master Police Officer Tyler Burdett. Sergeant Joe Perrette. Sergeant Brad Goodwin. Sergeant Herman Hurd. Sergeant Vince Lopez. Deputy Chief Mike Hunter. Thank you all very much. I just, uh, on behalf of my constituents, I can't speak for the council, but I just want to thank you for all the great work you do, the important work you do. I've been in the educational world all my life, and we always had police academies, so I was always very close to the officers and the, the chiefs and the sheriffs that uh, utilized our services. I even played in a bagpipe band with officers and sheriffs <laughs> and firefighters. So I just really admire the work you do and Thank you very personally. Uh, I'm glad that you all took the moment to introduce yourself so we can meet you personally. Thank you all. Thank you, Council Member Hankel. Thank you. Thank you for all introducing yourselves. And now I just learned something about <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Leslie. <laughs> um, thank you for your service. I know that every day is actually a officer day because um, you are what makes us safe. Um, and you um, are just somebody and the whole entity that our family admires. <clears throat> and I want to um, impress it upon uh, city council to do a ride along um, within our systems of our uh, police force. And I think it's it's really imperative that we know what happens um, when you guys are serving um, and the ladies too. Although the <laughs> council member Cohen says, where are all the ladies tonight? <laughs> they're working. They're working, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but there are many of them that we do have, so I know that for sure. So I just really appreciate your work and uh, I can't wait to come in and bring some snacks in the roll call again. Just for clarification, I said my name. Okay, correction. Any other council member comment? Well, Chief Appleman, would you like to say a few words? Thank you for honoring our National Police Week. I'm actually honored um, that we have this many of our folks who are about to come by tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you. Our next item under Petition City Communications it's a proclamation declaring May 15th to May 21st as Public Works Appreciation Week in the city and county of Brookfield. Will the representatives here to accept the proclamation please come and meet Mayor Pro Tem Jaderski at the podium. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, Mayor, um, members of council, Mayor Pro Tem. I am Kimberly Bell, the Director of Public Works for the City and County of Brookfield. Thank you. This proclamation recognizes the vital services of our public works professionals consistently providing to our residents in a dedicated and efficient manner. These services are essential to the well-being of our community and help us maintain our sustainability, resiliency, and high quality of life here in Broomfield. Therefore, as mayor, I hereby declare and proclaim May 15th to May 21st, 2022 as Public Works Appreciation Week in Broomfield, Colorado. Next, we'll take public comments on this item. Don't see any, any council member comments? I just gotta say, it's one of those things we take for granted because when your plumbing doesn't work, you know, <laughs> your whole life can come crashing down. We were talking about that at dinner. But thank you, and would you like to say a few words? <laughs> Thank you for showing the support of not only the Public Works Department in Broomfield, but there are so many more um, professionals and individuals that contribute to helping keep our community 
healthy, safe, um, in good working order, our parks department, um, our engineering group, all the capital improvement projects, everything that we do to protect our infrastructure. So thank you for showing your support. Thank you, Ms. Donald. I was supposed to say thank you for joining us this evening and for the dedication, efficiency, hard work, and all the important services our public works professionals consistently provide to the community. Next, under petitions and communications, we have a proclamation declaring June 2022 as Aging Well Awareness Month in the city and county of Broomfield. Will the representatives here to accept the proclamation please come and meet Mayor for February to by the podium? Some of the representatives, please introduce themselves. Good evening, I'm Bonnie Steele, a uh, child adult and family services supervisor. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. I'm Molly Jensen, and I am currently the manager of the Child Adult and Family Services Unit. Good evening, I'm Nikki Krauss. Senior Services Manager. Hi, good evening. Julie Kelly, Adult Protective Services Caseworker. Thank you. This proclamation brings awareness to the significance of the maltreatment of our valued aging community and as a public health and human rights issue. This is an increasing global problem that crosses all socioeconomic boundaries. This proclamation also recognizes the importance of social connection, resilience, and other protective factors of our aging community, which many of Broomfield services address, including adult protective services, senior services, the library, self-sufficiency, and the police department. Therefore, as mayor, I hereby declare and proclaim June 2022 as Aging Well Awareness Month in Broomfield, Colorado. And we'll take public comments on this item next. If anyone would like to comment. Next council, anyone like to comment? And finally, to our proclamation recipients, would you like to make any remarks? Yes, um, first, good evening council. Um, thank you for taking time and recognizing um, our Aging Well Month with the emphasis on connection is prevention. Um, I also wanna thank our CCOB staff and our many community partners who bring amazing services into Broomfield that makes it such a great community to age well in. Um, I also just want to take a minute to recognize Molly Jackson. It's her last city council meeting with us. Um, she has served us so well. I just want to acknowledge her. And Nikki uh, serves amazingly well uh, um, in our senior services. So thank you. Thank you. And I have to add to that because my mother-in-law um, is 95 and she lives with us. And without the amazing senior services that Broomfield provides, we wouldn't have the quality of life and she wouldn't have a community. And having that community makes all the difference. So thank you. All right, we'll move to public comment next. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on matters other than the items already listed elsewhere on this evening's agenda. As mentioned earlier, the public may comment both in person or via phone. If you're joining on the phone and want to be placed in the queue for comment, please call 855-695-3744 and press star three. If you're joining in person, please line up behind the podium and public comment will be limited to the time limits outlined earlier. We'll start with the in person. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on general topics, now would be the time. Seeing none, and I don't see any online. We'll move on to city council's community and event updates. Does any member of council have an update this evening? Thank you. I was trying to start my computer and it does not want to start. Oh, it just did, of course. But I'm on my phone. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, 
So what we're doing this weekend is on Saturday, uh, Fish, Springfield Fish is having a stamp out hunger um, Saturday so that if you get a bag, they're working with our local um, you know, post offices that you're getting a bag to put food into. Um, there is an announcement um, on my council member page um, and also uh, uh, through our Broomfield, um, I'm sorry, Broomfield Fish as well. Um, so again, this Saturday, um, leading up to the food drive, Broomfield residents um, will receive a stamped out hunger bag in their mailbox and they will use these bags to fill with non-perishable food items and then leave them by their mailboxes for postal carriers to collect along that route on Saturday. So you don't even have to go anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. I got my yellow bag. Thanks, Rotary. Any other council comments? Well, I recently learned about a local business that's doing great things. And I wanted to share this good news and celebrate the achievements of Broomfield's Rocky Mountain Music Repair and the owner, Brian Stevenson. This year, Rocky Mountain Music Repair is the only music store in Colorado to be named a top 100 dealer in the country by the National Association of Music Merchants. This award honors the very best retail music dealers who demonstrate exceptional commitment to their stores, neighborhoods, and customers, and share a vision to create a more musical world through their local communities. Rocky Mountain Music Repair submissions were centered around their School Secret Santa initiative that has given away more than $50,000 worth of instruments and band supplies over the past two years to support local teachers and band students. Please join me in thanking Brian Stevenson and Rocky Mountain Music Repair for providing support to our local buddy musicians and in wishing them good luck at the upcoming award ceremony in Anaheim, California, where they will be considered for the coveted Dealer of the Year Award. And I'd like you to uh, step up to the podium, Mr. Stevenson, and say a few words, if you don't mind. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to come. Um, my wife and I, um, the owner over there, we started our business nine and a half years ago here in Broomfield with three flutes that I bought on Craigslist that I fixed up and just the two of us sitting in a room that we never thought we'd be aware of, but I have a problem saying no to people. And so now we do all the repair work for Boulder Valley District, Jefferson County School District, um, the CU Buffalo Marching Band, uh, SQ27J out in Brighton, and we have a retail store here that now sells tons of new instruments, used instruments, and Repair is still at the heart of what we do. We love Broomfield. We live in Westlake Village, which I believe is Ward 5. I'm bad at geography. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter is actually in class with the councilman, uh, Chef Spun. Um, she goes to Cole Elementary. And our shop is right over just kind of by the Wendy's, just west of the Wendy's over there. And it's a little hard to find um, because we kind of figured when people would drop their trumpets or run over their saxophone with their car, they'd find us. Um, but now we've got lots of toys and things like that. We are so excited. We had no idea we were going to up from this board and we kind of threw a hat in the ring not thinking anything of it. Um, we're pretty, we like to do everything very local and very centered around our community and the School Secret Santa was a thing that we started a couple years ago and it keeps on growing and growing. It's kind of like Toys for Tots but for band directors. So near Christmas time people can buy an extra box of reeds or a bottle of olive oil or little things that even up to if you want to buy a French horn or a tuba for a school, they're not going to complain. And then we give it all away at the Christmas event to 25 to 30 local teachers and just kind of help out the band program that they need around here. So we put a submission in for that and somebody thought we were doing something pretty good. And so we're, we're super excited. We're going to go down to Anaheim to the big trade show. And there's a fancy dinner and we might win within our come within our um, community service category or we might win the deal with what we have money yet. But thank you so much for the invite. Thank you for letting me take a couple seconds to tell you about what we do. We we love being in Brookfield and we love working for the schools. That's where our passion lies. And so, yeah, so thank you once again for having us here. Um, like I say, I'd be remiss in that not recognizing my wife, Deanna. She's really the, the brains of the operation, and she takes all my crazy ideas and tells me whether they're stupid or not. So, <laughs> and once in a while, I get something pretty good, and I can see your sandals with it. So, so thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next is Council's consideration of the consent agenda. The clerk will read all of the consent agenda items by title, and there will be one opportunity for public comments and council questions and comments. Council will then be asked to approve the consent agenda with two separate motions, as item 7G is a request for an executive session and requires an individual motion. Following the clerk's reading of consent agenda items 7A through 7F, we will ask for public comments. 
Will the clerk please read the agenda item 7A through 7F by title. 7A, approval of minutes from April 26, 2022, regular meeting. 7B, ordinance number 2182, adopting as the primary code by reference to the Broomfield Standards and Specifications, 2022 edition and amending certain sections of chapter 14-04 of the Broomfield Municipal Code in accordance therewith for streeting. 7C, resolution number 2022-68, authorizing and approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and county of Broomfield and the regional transportation district repair reimbursement Broomfield flex ride service. 7D, resolution number 2022-69, authorizing and approving the agreement with Collier's Engineering and Design Incorporated for the design of fiber network. 70, resolution number 2022-37, authorizing the loan to Northwest Family Housing, LLC for the Northwest Department's Affordable Housing Project. Resolution number 2022-72, Authorizing and approving a memorandum of understanding regarding affordable housing and the waiver of specific Greenfield development fees and use taxes for the Northwest Department's affordable housing project. Lot 1, Lot 2 of Greenfield Business Center, filing number 135E. 7F, resolution number 2022-59, a resolution authorizing and approving the guaranteed maximum price amendment 1 to the construction agreement with Molds Construction Incorporated for the Mesa Booster Station project. Resolution number 2022-71, authorizing and approving the First Amendment to the consulting agreement with Arcadis U.S. Incorporated for the Mesa Booster Station. Thank you. We'll now proceed with public comments. Does any member of the public have comments? Please step up to the podium if you're in person. State your name and neighborhood for the record and limit your comments to three minutes, please. Hi, Roxy Jewel, what more? Um, on the resolution 2022-69, can anybody tell me what the timetable is for the engineers and the designers to get this done, or is it already done? Would you want to address that, Ms. Hoffman? You bet. Um, okay. The resident experts in the room, so we always defer to her. Director of IT, Katiri Vega. Thank you. Good evening, Council members, New York Mayor and Pro Tem. I'm Katiri Vega, the IT Director. Um, we have not begun any engineering work yet. We just went through the RFP process to select the engineering firm. Um, once we get going, um, if this is approved tonight, we will have a kickoff meeting um, probably next week. And um, we have four projects that are listed in the memo that we'll have them begin engineering on. Time frame, um, we're hoping to get the engineering done um, in the next two to three months. And then we'll be able to bid out the, the construction for those projects. Thank you, Ms. Vega. Thank you. Anyone else? Does any member of council have comments on the agenda item? Council Member Lim. Um, on, I have questions on 7E and 7G. Um, uh, thank you for, to staff for answering my questions on 7E about the um, loan for the affordable housing project. Um, when I asked about the prioritization of applicants, the response was that um, we can't prioritize Broomfield residents or people who work in Broomfield because of the um, federal government CHAFA, um, in the CHAFA loans that are involved in the project. So I guess my question is, this is one of the first that we're looking at. Do we anticipate that in order to be fis fiscally balanced, that these projects are all going to have external funding that prohibits Broomfield from prioritizing its own residents? 
is this a is this something that will continue most likely that we should be prepared for? I'm going to ask Rachel King to come, um, but while she's making her way to the podium, Councilmember Lynn, when you have federal funding, you can't prioritize um, any specific local government. So anything that has that funding that is attached to it, um, we can't specifically prioritize um, the residents unless it is um, even when. Uh, I guess I should say, even when it's Broomfield dollars, um, regardless of the amount of those dollars or where the balance of those dollars is, are. Ms. King. Thank you, Manager Hoffman. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor for Town City Council. Thank you for the question, Council Member Um, As Manager Hoffman was indicating, um, the recent federal guidance on this has shifted in the last few years. So um, regardless of whether the funding is Lottie Tech or um, Broomfield City Funds, or uh, truthfully, the guidance is expanding a little bit past that as well, we'll start to see um, a shift in what jurisdictions are recommended to adopt as far as um, preference policies for local residents and workers. So, so I guess the answer is yes, we should anticipate this going forward for the most part. And I, I just, we were reflecting on this somewhat in the ACES meeting last night, and you might not obviously see the connection there, but um, you know, if when we're talking about um, reducing GHG emissions, we're trying to reduce transportation of people in and out of the city. And if these if this is workforce housing, we would like the workforce housing who live and reside in Broomfield to you know to have priority to live here because of many reasons, but one of which that we were reflecting on in ACES was because of travel to work, you know, and minimizing that, so. Okay, so I wanted to clarify if that's what was ahead. And I think Councilmember Blim, um, every, everyone is in agreement with that, um, as far as the wanting to prioritize it. These uh, affordable housing developments, as we all know, and Council's learning more and more, they are expensive. <clears throat> and um, moving forward, it's really a it, given it's a finite pot of money, not just from Bluefield, not just from the state, not just from the feds, and not just from the developers. It really does take a culmination of efforts. Um, it's highly complex, these, these, these funding mechanisms in order to get these projects in. So um, yeah, the answer is is unfortunate for us internally. Um, but I would think it would be even as we move forward. Um, you're going to see, I would think, more and more restrictions from the feds, um, not only reporting restrictions, but with those dollars that are going to be attached for that affordable housing. So again, and everything is exponentially more expensive than it was even a year ago. And if I may, Manager Hoffman, I'll add a clarifying point. Um, while uh, the guidelines are recommending for jurisdictions to stay away from strict preference policies. There are other mechanisms that can be used to target marketing, for example, to local community members um, and some other mechanisms where we can target those opportunities um, to the local residents without actually uh, violating those fair housing laws. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Um, my question on 7F is about the construction agreement um, for, the, for the Mesa Booster Station project. So the memo describes that this project was originally budgeted in 2018. And of course the construction costs have gone up since then. And so I wondered, uh, first of all, why it was delayed. And secondly, the design services increased, I don't know, like 300% or something also. So I'm trying to figure out the explanation for why the design services increased so much. I, I, Kind of obvious to me why the construction costs split up since 2018. Ms. Allen. Uh, thank you, Katie Allen, City and County Engineer. Um, to, just to clarify, the resolution for the design services is for construction administration support from the engineer through the construction process. Does that, does that explain why it would have gone up 300%? It doesn't, it, 
it, it seemed obvious to me why construction itself would have gone up, but it uh, maybe I misread the numbers. It, it, I understood the design, the contract for the oversight of the construction went from 88,000 to 248,000. Did I read that wrong? So, no, there's three parts to the design. We started the design, that was the original agreement, and then it was uh, the project was uh, delayed and tabled. Then the 88,000 was to complete the design at a later date. So, the first two numbers are the total cost for the design 306, 655 plus the 88,000. So the 159,000 um, amendment one, the resolution tonight is for. Construction administration systems during construction. Okay, thank you. Council Member Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Um, question for staff on 7B. Um, what is the height of the proposed raised medians on, along these cross sections? The reason I'm asking is that um, there's been, I've heard from several residents that live along uh, Midway between Sheridan and Ash and the they voice concerns about the height of that median and the and the then the vegetation on top of that makes it difficult to want to make a left turn because it's the eye line is too high for the cars. So we know what the proposal of this proposal would be. Uh, Council member <coughs> Marshall, excuse me. Um, we're not proposing changing the median height, and I don't have that uh, detail in front of me. Um, is, there is a six inch vertical curb, and then there's a sloped um, concrete, uh, what we call splash block. Um, and I don't have that slope memorized or distance to calculate that height. And then we have a 2% berm behind that. So I'd have to do look at it and do some quick calculations to get it for you. Okay, but it's something that we could take into consideration the outline of a driver that would be able to see over yeah. the vegetation. Yes, um, we certainly learned it the hard way many times in terms of site distances and what plants go on top of that. And if somebody overburns it, what those what, what the impacts are. I don't know if I made some revisions, but uh, yeah, we aren't addressing that specifically in um, the street sections. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Shad. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I wanted to start on 7F, uh, the uh, Mesa Booster Station. Um, so you know, one of the uh, pieces of the council memo is says in August 2016, the existing airport booster pump station, a key component in Broomfield's potable water system failed, resulting in critical reduction in fire flow protection for several days with a higher elevation water pressure zones in southwest Broomfield, known as the Mesa and Walnut Zone. So given uh, the recent conversations that we've had around uh, the Marshall Fire, I was curious, do these risks still exist today? Or have we found some type of workaround that uh, that is not going to, because the construction on this is still several years uh, down the road, uh, do we have a workaround or is this risk not there, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, given recent conversations around the Marshall Fire? Uh, I would say the risk is still there um, until we have this redundant system. Um, we are we have a risk of not having a backup um, fire flow pump in the existing uh, airport booster station. Uh, do we have some type of workaround that we've identified uh, that, that reduces that amount of risk that we have? I'm looking to our public works director if she has any comments. Thanks. Um, thank you for the question. Right now, what we do is monitor heavily so that we are in advance of anything that may occur. But right now, if we have a pump go down, we would be relying on things like rentals, um, other ways to try to boost the pressures in the station. However, based on the demands, um, it's unlikely that we would be able to meet the requirements. That's why this project is fairly critical. Okay. And for this, uh, there isn't any way to speed this up in terms of fast tracking this project. So as, you, as we noted in the memo, we didn't have the funding for the full, full amount. So the way to speed this up is to do uh, 
start this first phase, which allows us to order the laundry item pumps. Um, so we're doing everything we can with the funding available to get this going as fast as possible. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have is uh, around 7C, which is the RTD reimbursement. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about the, uh, the, the you know, beginning 2022, RTD identified subsidized transit uh, fares uh, are not supported by the current grant source. And so we will be uh, paying RTD uh, through this IGA for that, uh, that flex ride service. And I was curious uh, with the, uh, you know, granted the, the bill is uh, Senate Bill 22180, uh, which is the reduced ozone. Uh, through increased transit legislation, which would provide free uh, summer fares um, because those seasons uh, um, uh, coordinate or, or land at the same time, uh, is there a possibility that we would then get uh, reimbursed uh, through that grant funding through the uh, legislation or at this point, do we know that? Thank you. Good evening. I'm Sarah Grant, Transportation Manager for the City and County of Broomfield. That is a great question, Council Member Schaaf. And as noted in the memo, um, if the free fare um, ozone does come through, uh, through RTD uh, for one of the months that we are planning to do a free fare summer, for example, if it's August, we would not have to pay for that month to RTD. So that would be covered under uh, the legislation. Okay, so Broomfield would be would get reimbursed as opposed to RTD kind of getting reimbursed. And um, just to clarify, RTD would not send us the bill for that month. Okay. And our portion would be reduced accordingly. Um, RTD has given us an estimate um, for each month for June, July, and August, and uh, it would be reduced accordingly. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilmember Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my questions are also in regards to 7C. <laughs> um, instead of having a free fare, Summer, have you looked at instead of subs, um, subsidizing the free fares, expanding service in the Broomfield uh, flex ride to the north of the higher 44th? Is that maybe a conversation? Um, RTD would be willing to have. Thank you, Councilmember Ward. That is a really great question. Um, with the current grant that we have, uh, we are to expand service north of 144, but at this time, uh, RTD has noted that they don't have the resources to expand north of 144, um, and we have ongoing conversations. In fact, uh, we have one scheduled before the end of the month to continue discussing full implementation of our grant resources. Okay, perfect. And then my next question is um, also where I should say and see why was specifically the Broomfield flex ride chosen and maybe not the Westmore analogic flex ride, which also serves. Um, that's another great question, Council Member Ward. Um, so when we originally started this program in 2018, we were really focused on the ridership uh, levels for the Broomfield Flex Ride, which during the summer months dropped significantly due to students utilizing the service. Um, the ridership is a bit more steady over on the interlocking service, obviously prior to COVID. So our focus was on um, improving ridership, bringing greater awareness to the service, um, and focusing on those summer months um, when there's more capacity to um, introduce the flex ride and get more families uh, introduced to the service. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was going to ask the same question about expanding the service area because there's a whole population that's growing up there that aren't being served. So maybe we can withhold some of our RTD funds and do it ourselves. Yeah. Mayor, if I may, mm -hmm. spent the afternoon actually with uh, Ms. Allen and Ms. Grant talking specifically about RTD. Mm -hmm. um, the mayor and I um, and Ms. Grant will be meeting uh, with Ms. Johnson and our representative, Eric Davidson, um, looked at the numbers today. Broomfield, since 2005, Mayor, the number was higher than uh, we even thought. It's $150 million that just Broomfield has um, given to RTD a split between base services um, and the rail. So uh, the tipping point is um, restoring services. So they're not even at the point, council member work, of expanding services. Um, restoring services on 128 isn't even on the table. So um, at, at some point we rattle the cages and that point is now. I concur. 
Thank you, City Manager Huffman, for that. And thank you all. Before asking for a motion, I want to remind everyone that item 7C is an intergovernmental agreement and requires two-third approval of the council. Is there a motion by council that the recommendations contained in the staff reports for agenda items 7A through 7F be approved? Councilmember Ward. Uh, so moved. Second. Thank you. May I have a second? Councilmember Shaw? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Ward. Thank you, Mayor. The only um, this agenda item I want to talk about is with regards to setting um, the, the traffic design standards. Um, I have been emailing back and forth with Ms. Allen for the past couple of days, and I appreciate her answers. Um, and I guess the only comment that I want to make is really to look at um, Kind of changing the designs we have with a few of our um, street designs when it comes to bike safety, because even though it has been noted that you know we're only seeing two thousand to six thousand cars a day with roughly twenty five mile an hour speed limit on like a commercial or multifamily connector street, riding a bike going down one of those streets when a car passes you going thirty twenty five. 40, if they're speeding, doesn't feel safe. And I'm probably one of like 7% that was identified in one of our bike transportation um, surveys who would be that's like fairly confident to ride in the street. Um, and we did know that 50 ish, 59% of our residents are open but concerned about riding in the street. And I think that's really something to look at where you create. Uh, barriers such as instead of doing travel lane, bike lane, park cars, you do travel lane, park cars, bike lane, uh, just to give that extra layer of safety, as well as provide a buffer for all of the gunk that cars kind of blow off to the side. That's really uh, damaging to bike tires because they are not quite as robust as a car tire. There's less surface area, they're thinner, etc. Um, so that's the only comment that I really wanted to make in regards to seven. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Marshall. I was saying Councilmember Ward's comments. The importance of uh, moving away from just by car centric roads into more of a holistic multimodal um, feature for everybody. Thank you. Any other discussion? If I may just quickly, um, Ms. Grant, will you uh, very briefly tell us the timeline from uh, CDOT's mobility 120th study that's going to be occurring? Doesn't impact the street guidelines, makes recommendations. Um, and, and, and before you do, Ms. And we've talked before about retrofitting how expensive retrofitting is. Um, so what is and isn't feasible, um, and it just takes dollars, a lot of them. So really the, the prioritization with those um, safety first as always, um, but retrofitting existing suburban streets um, aren't wide enough. I think Ms. Allen had indicated this in one of her responses to have like they do on Broadway. Right where you have the lanes and then you have the parked cars, and then you have what you were talking about, Councilmember Ward, with the with the bikes next to the sidewalks. Um, redesigning is feasible, um, but this wouldn't be redesigning the streets, right? It would be finding those right of ways, repaving and re-sidewalking. Um, so I just want again, just kind of managing the expectations about what what we can do what is feasible to do, um, and then the dollars that are uh, attached to do that. But <laughs> some, um, some studies um, are upcoming. Ms. Grant, you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, thank you, Manager Hoffman. Um, we are working with CPOT to implement a uh, multimodal and safety study along 120th Avenue and West 287 in Broomfield. Um, and we will be working with CDOT to uh, look at potential improvements that we can make to improve that arterial corridor that is also 
um, a high injury corridor identified in, in Broomfield by Dr. Cog. And um, it's also identified as one of our top corridors in pedestrian bicycle assessment to make improvements. Okay, who pays for that, Ms. Grant? Uh, we have secured funding through Dr. Cog uh, to do that. And we have a Broomfield local match of $60,000. And um, the postcards will be going out probably sometime in the next few weeks, and we'll certainly send you all an update before those go out. Um, but again, see that will be managing the project, and we will be working side by side with them on those uh, on that study. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Anything else from council before we vote? All right, all in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is Council's consideration of consent agenda item 7G, a request for an executive session. Will the City and County Attorney please read the motion? That an executive session be held on May 17, 2022, prior to Council's study session, for the purpose of obtaining instruction and negotiators and providing legal advice regarding the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority as permitted by CRS section 246402. For B and E. Thank you. Is there a motion? Councilmember Leslie? I'll move it. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Marshall Shin? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? As a reminder, requests for executive session require an affirmative vote of two thirds of the quorum present. All those in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. There is no business before the Board of Social Services or the Board of Health this evening. The first item under council business this evening is the public hearing and council's consideration on second and final reading of proposed ordinance number 2161, amending certain sections of Title 17 of the Brookfield Municipal Code relating to oil and gas financial assurance. I'll now declare the public hearing open and we will follow the city's standard public hearing procedures with staff presenting a summary of the proposal and the applicant's presentation is applicable public comments, final comments from the applicant, and finally questions from city council members. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Nancy Rogers, your city and county attorney. I'm gonna introduce Mike Foote, who is outside the special counsel for oil and gas matters. Mike's been lead on this ordinance. Um, and he did a presentation or answered questions on first reading. So we're gonna do a short summary now and then leave it open for questions, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Foote. Great, thank you very much. And good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Rich and members of council. Um, it's been pretty non-controversial so far here tonight. So uh, we'll see if that happens again with an oil and gas matter. But um, as has been mentioned, this is the second reading. There was a Q&A session that I was happy to uh, answer your question on from the first reading. My intent is to go through this uh, short slideshow very quickly, probably less than a minute or so per slide, and then of course take any questions that you have. Uh, but just to set the stage, um, I think you all are aware that the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission recently completed their update of financial assurances rules and that update went into effect at the end of April. So those new rules are now in effect. And also, as you know, um, the Oil and Gas Act allows for local governments to put in more protective rules, uh, including something like financial assurances. And that's really uh, the bottom line of what this proposed ordinance would do. It would put in um, some more protective financial assurance rules um, to improve upon what the COGCC did in their financial assurance rulemaking that just took effect. So next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> the main point of this proposed ordinance is really to protect against wells that should really be plugged. And uh, to take that down uh, another level, really what you're looking at here is an effort to improve public health, safety, welfare, and the environment, as well as for beneficial land use by, again, um, protecting against wells that uh, are at such low production that they really should be plugged. Uh, one way, of course, that you brought about doing this has been through reverse setbacks. You have already decided that this is not a substitute, but it's complementary to that, particularly when it comes to beneficial land use. Uh, one thing I want to um, uh, correct from the presentation or the Q&A that, that I gave last time was that I mentioned that this ordinance was designed to be retrospective. And I want to make sure the record is clear. It's really designed to be retroactive as opposed to retrospective. That actually makes a difference. 
um, under the Constitution, retrospective laws are unconstitutional, but retroactive laws are constitutional. Um, so this is designed to be retroactive, and really what that means is it would apply to wells that are already within the city and county of Broomfield. <clears throat> and so, uh, of course, it wouldn't make sense to do something like this um, going forward because your ordinance has already deal with uh, full bonding for any kind of well that you permit going forward. So it is designed to be retroactive and not retrospective, as I mistakenly said during the last presentation. Um, so the COGCC rulemaking uh, did make improvements upon what was their rules for financial assurances. Uh, what came out was um, better, in my opinion, but also quite complicated. It's really going to depend on the execution, but there are areas for improvement, and that is what this ordinance is designed to do in a specific spot. So <clears throat> next slide, please. There is room for a more protective measure, uh, particularly when it comes to low producing wells. And that's what this ordinance, this proposed ordinance focuses on. One thing I want to highlight here, and it's the second bullet point, it's a note, um, just to make sure that everybody realizes that local governments cannot order a operator to plug and abandon a well. That's within the exclusive province of the COGCC, um, not local governments. Now, the new rules do have a process where local governments can petition the COGCC to then order an operator to plug and abandon a well. That would involve three years of a well being low producing, as well as the petitioner convincing the COGCC that the well is either a threat to public health, safety, welfare, or the environment, or is no longer used and useful. This proposed ordinance takes a different track. It uh, just says that after a certain period of time, if the well is low producing under the definition of the ordinance, then the operator has two choices. The operator can either choose to uh, plug and abandon the well, um, or the operator can choose to bond up. And so that's a different approach that it takes uh, that's different than what the current COGCC regulations put into place. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the quick ordinance summary here, uh, as, as you can see, it does involve a definition for low producing wells that is similar to the COGCC definition, but not the same. It uh, uh, importantly um, focuses on the two big BOE or barrels of oil equivalent threshold, which was adopted by the COGCC, but it does not adopt the COGCC definition word for word. Um, it has a, a timeline for operator action on low producing wells, and it produces um, or it requires that choice between plugging and abandoning the well or bonding up after a certain period of time. It also includes a variance process if the operator uh, is, is unable to comply either with both of the with both of those choices. They can go through the variance process as, as uh, other applicants could do. And it's also related to the current financial assurance amount that would be imposed on any new wells through the special use process that you have in ordinance already under Chapter 17-54. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, it, it, because it also uh, adopts the same kind of uh, financial assurance amount, it also adopts the same kind of financial assurance types. Again, it just relates back to the ordinance you already have in place in 17-54. Next slide. Staff process has been discussed and strategic initiatives uh, does have the capacity and will manage uh, monitoring, notifying the operators, and also managing the enforcement of this particular ordinance should pass. And that should conclude the slideshow. Hopefully that was less than a minute per slide as promised, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, you may have at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you for that really great presentation, Mr. Foot. We'll now proceed with public comments. If there's anyone in person who would like to comment on this item, please step up to the podium and, and you know the drill. Roxy Julia Lockmore. Um, I have this list of the wells that you guys had online. Um, I'd like to know how I can get map of some of these and the ones that are considered yes under uh, low production. Are any of those on the east side of I 25 and north of Highway 7? Uh, but I'd like to, to get a map or something of both sides of this, if that's at all possible. Ms. Jewel, we can get you that map. 
So it, how about my other question? Are any of these that are under yes right now on the east side of I-25 and north of Mr. Fred, would you be kind enough to answer that question, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, um, in fact, uh, most of the, the wells that would be affected are in that general vicinity. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Putt. Any other public comment in person? We have one caller online for remote public comment, so we'll go to you, Alejandra Major. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Alejandra Major, and I'm an associate director for the American Petroleum Institute, Colorado. API represents all facets of the natural gas and oil industry in Colorado. I'm grateful for your time tonight to reiterate some of our concerns with this proposed ordinance. Colorado boasts some of the most stringent oil and gas regulations in the country following the, Sen the passage of Senate Bill 181 and a myriad of rulemakings. These rulemakings include the COGCC's recent revisions to financial assurance requirements, which includes an expansion of the current orphan well program funded by operator well fees. API Colorado would like to voice our concerns once more, particularly around the definition of low producing wells. During the financial assurance rulemaking in March, the COGCC defined low producing wells as oil or gas wells that produce a daily average of less than two barrels of oil equivalent or 10,000 cubic feet of natural gas equivalent over the previous 12 months. This proposed ordinance, however, seeks to define a low produce, producing one, well as one that produces two barrels of oil equivalent per day or less of oil and or natural gas per month. The difference between these sums could lead to varying calculations of production over the course of 12 months. Additionally, this proposal also includes shut-in and inactive and temporarily abandoned wells in its definition of low-producing wells, creating an additional inconsistency between the county and the COGCC. The discrepancy between this proposed ordinance and the state may hamper the COGCC's efforts to ensure that abandoned and non-producing wells are plugged, abandoned, and reclaimed. The rules passed by the COGCC in March incentivize operators to place low producing and inactive wells on a plugging list and designate those wells out of service, as is this ordinance removes those incentives to place wells on a plugging list. Senate Bill 181 authorized local governments additional regulatory authority, but imposed constraints on a local government's latitude in regulating oil and gas operations. A local government's exercise of its Senate Bill 181 powers must be both necessary and reasonable and designed to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts that cannot be avoided. This proposed language appears to be neither reasonable nor necessary and could in fact discourage an operator from placing wells on their plugging list, thereby delaying wells plugging and abandonment. API Colorado continues to strongly encourage Broomfield to align regulations with the COGCC to the extent possible to ensure a seamless process that allows the city and county, state, and operators to work together. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to comment this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is council member questions. Uh, any council members? Council member Leslie? Mr. Foote, would you mind responding to that? Please. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things. Um, regarding the, um, the definition of um, low producing, uh, and having it at two BOE. Now, we made sure to not have it at just two barrels of oil, but also make it at two BOE. So that does account for any gas production that comes out of the wells. And um, the Broomfield wells, or the wells that are located in Broomfield are, they produce both gas and oil. Um, the COGCC definition was um, substantially longer and more complicated. And um, that was done in part because of stakeholder feedback from the industry, particularly on the Western Slope. Um, they were concerned about measurements that were, that would affect the Western Slope operators that uh, whose wells produce gas. Um, and so the COGCC went through the process and decided to make their definition of what they did. Going through the process here and going through our staff here, um, there was, consternation about how that definition was going to apply to wells here. And so really to um, make this a 
something that was um, executable, something that was enforceable, and something that was applicable to roofed wells, uh, we decided that the two BOE, uh, the flat two BOE definition was going to be most appropriate. Um, it may end up creating a little bit more of a burden on the operators to calculate two BOE um, with just the root field wells as opposed to the definition that they use through the CRDCC, but um, it's our judgment that that burden is not going to be an unreasonable burden for them to do. So regarding also that the definition that's proposed here uh, does include shut-in wells and inactive wells, um, well, that, that really is going to be um, inevitable. I mean, if there's a shut-in well, if there's an inactive well, then it's necessarily producing less than two BOE. So uh, it was our judgment that we wanted to uh, just make that clear so there was no question that anything that's producing less than two BOE, including a shut-in well, including an inactive well, would be included in this definition. So that was done um, through or for the reasons of clarity. Um, there was a comment about how this may discourage the putting uh, of wells on the out of service list. And that comment was made last time. I thought it through, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm not quite following. And the reason why I'm not really quite following it is because there already will be an incentive um, through the COGCC process for an operator to put their low producing or inactive wells on the out of service list because that does not count towards their financial assurance responsibilities. Regardless of what Broomfield or any local government does, um, the benefit that the operator gets by putting their wells on the out of service list is that they don't have to pay financial assurances or increase financial assurances to the CODCC for that. In return, the operator has to promise to plug the well by a certain date, which right now under the rules would run between 2027 and 2030. Um, so this process here, if adopted, would um, more than likely result in wells being plugged earlier than they went into the COGCC process. Uh, because this ordinance would uh, ultimately start in May of 2023 if, if approved as currently drafted, um, which of course is four years before even the earliest date for wells to be plugged in the out of service list um, under the COGCC rules. Um, so I, I don't see how that incentive would change regardless of what the local government does, but um, of course, open to further discussion about that if anyone has any other ideas. I, that may have covered everything else or everything that was mentioned in the comment, but if there's something else that I missed, I'm happy to try to respond to that as well. Thank you. Council Member Marshall Schuchman. Thank you, Chair. I just have one question regarding enforcement. Um, you said we don't have the authority to tell them to plug them in, right? Correct. Um, so if, for example, they Meet the definition and they refuse to plug them in and refuse to pay assurances. Is the only enforcement mechanism going to COGCC or is there a way to enforce the ordinance through court action? Uh, the, the idea would be that this ordinance is enforced like any other ordinance through the city process. Um, it would not be an enforcement to actually plug the well because, as, as you mentioned, the local government does not have that authority. But if they decided that they were just going to ignore the ordinance and not bond up, then that could be enforceable through the normal uh, enforcement mechanisms through the city. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lynn. Uh, yes. Um, I listened to the COGCC financial assurance operator meeting, which was public this morning, and that generated questions related a little bit to ours. So um, this the COGCC was saying that they, obviously their calculation is more complex, but they said they're going to generate the in the form, the cost for the operator. Do we have any intentions in this process of providing what we think the operator should be paying, should be providing financial assurances based on our formula? Well, um, I don't think it's anticipated that Rufa would go through the same process that the COGCC has decided to do. Um, part of that is because the COGCC is covering 50,000 wells statewide. Broomfield is, is just a couple of dozen or so. Um, but this does, as I mentioned, this relates back to your, your current financial assurances rules. And so if the operator decides to bond up, they would just bond up and pay the bond or post the bond or whatever financial assurance they would post. 
according to what's already in the ordinance, which is um, a measurement by square footage uh, with with not not to be any less than one hundred thousand dollars per well. So they would just have to go by that formula that's already in the ordinance. Um, in the process, will there be um, a release of the bond after P and A, and at what point in that P and A process will the bond be or will our bond be released? Will it wait until after reclamation? Uh, to answer your first question, yes, it would ultimately be released. Um, I'm not sure I can quite answer your second question because that would probably be more up to staff as to when it's anticipated to be released. But um, I think the intent is that it would be released after flood abandonment and reclamation because that's when the entire site is, is back to normal. Okay. Um, and what will be the um, process if an operator is in bankruptcy while this threshold of 12 months of the low producing well is met. I mean, we, we know from experience with another operator in Broomfield that it takes a year for bankruptcy in this case. Right. Um, I'm not sure I can totally answer that question, not being much of an expert in bankruptcy, but I'm going to maybe speculate and maybe get in trouble. I'll probably hand it over to the city attorney to, to correct me if I'm wrong. But, you know, during bankruptcy, there's uh, many, many uh, uh, requirements are stayed during the course of bankruptcy. And, and so um, I'm going to speculate that this might be one of those. Um, but um, that is something that I'm not sure I know the answer to. So if somebody else wanted to jump in, that would be fine. Or yeah. just leave it on Thanks, Mr. Fudd. It does depend on when the bankruptcy is filed and when the obligation to post the bond occurs. If the obligation to post the bond occurs before, we might be a creditor in the bankruptcy proceedings. If it occurs during the proceeding, then we might try to get involved with the bankruptcy proceeding to ask that they not be relieved of that obligation. Um, so, and, and there's there's a lot in between, like, like Mr. Fudd said, even if we're able to assert that the obligation should remain, it is stayed. So no money will leave that company to be put in our coffers because everything's on hold during the bankruptcy. But similar to what we did in the extraction bankruptcy proceeding, we would be actively involved to make sure that if the company remains at the end of bankruptcy, that obligation would also remain. Or if the company was going to be liquidated, that whoever ends up with this asset, that well as an asset, would also have that obligation. Okay. And so, one thing that I'm, thank you, and one thing I'll mention, Councilman, then is to keep in mind that we do have the two processes here. So we would have the local process as well as the state process. And so an operator um, uh, would be likely to have already posted some kind of financial assurance with the state. And so that would help ensure against uh, some kind of uh, just an orphan well without any kind of financial assurance. But one of the problems is, is that, of course, Brookfield doesn't have any control over the orphan well fund and how quickly an uh, orphan well would be remediated and plugged and abandoned. So there are these two uh, somewhat redundant processes to help protect public health, safety, and welfare even more if this ordinance were to pass. And then um, Attorney Rogers was referring to a transfer based in bankruptcy, but I was also thinking broader. This process covers any transfer of wells outside of bankruptcy also. So the obligation for the new operator continues in the same way they do the financial insurance if the well is transferred. Um, well, the transfer of wells is something that the COGCC deals with. That's not going right. to be something that we would get to transfer. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we would be able to follow up with the new operator with the financial assurance obligation. Yes, that's going to be part of the execution of it. I mean, once the financial assurance is posted here, then it's within Bloomfield's control as to when the financial assurance is returned and also to account for any transfer of wells. Okay. And um, I had a question in general about how operators are complying with our process that we put in place in 17 before 110. And that was the regulation that said that they uh, the operators have to register and pay a fee by July, and they have to do that annual, annually. 
um, do we have full compliance with that? And I thought perhaps if we can't even, that might give us some indication if they're ready to comply with financial assurance, if they can or cannot comply with something simpler with our registration. Um, if I can look, get Mindy's attention, our oil and gas manager is here. If you could uh, respond to Councilmember Lynn's question about what's the status of the current fee payment and posting bonds with our current operators. Thank you. Good evening, Council Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, it's my understanding at this point, we don't have that fee program in place. Uh, so that is still pending as of this point. Oh, okay, that's that's fine. I thought it I thought it was my understanding that it would be in place by now, but I'll follow up on that. I was just trying to use that as an indication of operator cooperation. I'll I, I can that. also follow up um, on that as well and, and get back with you on that. Okay, thanks. Those are all my questions. All right, thank you. Any other council member questions? Council member Schaaf. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So just one quick uh, question. So, um, you know, we've, we found out that definition of, of individual words matters uh, when it comes to this. So I, I was curious, uh, when it talks about that Broomfield cannot mandate an operator plug and abandon a well, uh, the best Broomfield can do is after three years of inactivity, petition the COTCC to order the well plug and abandon. So when we're talking about in, in activity, are we talking about a shut-in well that's been Shut in for three years. Is that a low producing? You know what? What is? What are we talking about when we're talking about an inactive well? And I know that could be very uh, basic, but I just wanted to make sure that I'm on the same page. Right. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Shaft. So, um, I, I, you might be reading up from the staff memo um, on that, and and it should read that it's three years of low producing under the COGCC definition. So, if there's three years of low producing under this under the COGCC definition, then a local government, as well as a landowner, could petition the COGCC to order a well to be plugged and abandoned if they are able to show that the well is a threat to public health, safety, and welfare, or no longer used and useful. So they have to first show that it's been low producing for three years under the COGCC definition, and then show that it's a threat to public health, safety, and welfare, or used and useful. And then at that point, if both of those are shown, by the petitioner, like the local government, then the COGCC can order the operator to plug the well under the rules. Okay, great. I'm glad I asked the question to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member questions? All right. There being no further questions, the public hearing is closed. Next is council's consideration of proposed ordinance number 2161. Will the clerk please read proposed ordinance number 2161 by title? 11A public hearing ordinance number 2161 amending certain sections of title 17 of the Broomfield Municipal Code relating to oil and gas financial assurances, second and final reading. Thank you. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Council Member Ward. Thank you. I move that ordinance number 2161 be adopted. Thank you. Is there a second? Council uh, Member Ward. Aye, sir. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Council Member Lynn? Um, I just wanted to, to point out how important this is um, for public health and safety and for emissions. There was a recent study published in Nature Communications that um, showed that roughly half of the methane emitted from all U.S. well sites were was emitted by 6% of the country's um, production and from these low producing wells. So um, we have data that shows these low producing wells are the problems um, for public health and safety for GHG emissions um, and um, besides our own land use um, purposes, we um, support this ordinance going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just want to say how grateful I am for SB 181 and returning our local land use authority to us where it should have been in the first place. Thank you so much, Mr. Foote. All those in favor? Any opposed? 
that passes unanimously. Next item under council business this evening is the public hearing and council's consideration on second and final reading of proposed ordinance number 2171, amending chapter four through eight of the Roofville Municipal Code relating to municipal campaign finance. I'll now declare the public hearing open. We'll follow the city standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. And our city county clerk, Erica Delaney Lou, on second reading, Ms. Delaney Lou. Hi, yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. Um, as Manager Hoffman noted, I'm Erica Delaney Lou, city and county clerk, and I'm here tonight on Ordinance 2071, 2171. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, amending Chapter 408 of the Broomfield Municipal Code regarding campaign finance. Um, my summary is very brief. Jake, if you'll hit the next slide, I've only got four. So um, this ordinance will impose campaign contribution limits for council member races in the amount of $1,250 and for the mayoral race in the amount of $2,500. These limits would not apply to the expenditure of a candidate's own funds. And we have written into the ordinance that um, they will be adjusted according to the um, Denver Metro Area Consumer Price Index in the first quarter of even numbered years. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, the ordinance adopts additional earlier campaign finance reporting requirements. So instead of the first report that candidates or committees would be turning in being due uh, 21 days before the election, that's mid to or early to mid October, the first um, required reporting period will actually be August 5th for any contributions or expenditures made in the month of July. So you can see three new reporting periods have been added before what is currently required. Um, that's something specifically that council wanted. Um, and then these reporting requirements are going to apply to candidate committees, independent expenditure committees, issue and political committees, as well as to the expenditures of standalone candidates. So a standalone candidate who doesn't take any contributions, therefore has no contributions to report, but they are still required to report their expenditures, and it would be on this same enhanced schedule. Next slide, please. Um, finally, in addition with the direction given by City Council at the study session on February 15th, the Broomfield Campaign Finance Guide is also being updated at the same time. This doesn't happen by the ordinance, um, but I did I'll go ahead and make the revisions and attach that to the memo for you all to see. And that's going to change to require political committees to register before accepting contributions or spending $200. Formerly, our guide had a loophole of 10 days that we're removing now. Um, then the, the guide is also being changed to comply with the changes implemented by the ordinance to formalize the existing practice of posting reports on our website within 24 hours of their receipt and also to provide for posting of the violation findings, penalties, and complaints imposed once the findings are issued. So lastly, you'll note in the ordinance that there is some language shown in red, and that is a change to the ordinance since you saw it on first reading that just clarifies the fact that any violations of Chapter 408 or rules like the guidebook promulgated in accordance with Rule 408 or the Colorado Campaign Finance Practices Act in general will be enforced through the civil penalty um, provisions by the city and county clerk and not something that would be going to municipal court. So I'm here for any questions that you might have um, with what's before you tonight. And also Deputy City Attorney Pat Gilbert is also here for any um, legal questions that come up. Thank you so much, Ms. Delaney Lou. We'll now proceed with public comment. Does any member of the public have comments on this agenda item? I don't see any online. Uh, next is questions from council. Council Member Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the only question I have so far is uh, with regards to the reporting period, are we still keeping the um, after the election is over and a candidate committee, for example, is still um, open? Just the one time, one year reporting period for any collection. Um, money that was collected or expenses made, or are we 
also moving more towards kind of like the state does where you have a monthly report regardless of whether or not they're an election year so that is the not frequent or they don't have an active election item and that is annual and that's not being changed by this ordinance all right thank you thank you council member marshall Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a question regarding the reporting action that I just noticed and I wanted to make sure to clarify. Um, 408080B1 it says monthly reports for each month, the complete months of July, August, September, bottom of fifth month, fifth day of the next month. Um, that doesn't specify that the July report should um, include everything from the beginning of the campaign. Is that, not, am I reading that correctly or? So if you file your campaign, yes. you file a campaign in, Jan in July or sorry, January. According to the way this is written, it appears like you don't have to report that at all. Is that? You, I think this language probably could be improved <laughs> so that basically from the time of starting your campaign through July would be included with the first report. Is that something we should amend before we pass this? Mm -hmm. The others have specific start and end dates for the period. I think we should be consistent. Yeah. All right, if you can give us a, a minute, um, we'll see if we can suggest some alternative language. That's all I have. Thank you. No, good, good point. Mm -hmm. While you're while you while you have a minute, I'll maybe move on to Council Member Shannon. Okay, so okay, Council Member Shannon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, I was curious. So after the first reading, uh, the staff added section one and two, and I'm curious, um, kind of what uh, authority that gives to the city and county clerk, or what authority is already given, and why that was added. So if you can go into a little bit more detail on on why staff brought forward that section one and two. Certainly. Um, so as we added this language with the contribution limits in particular, um, what what the discussion sort of arose with is someone, a candidate, in practice, a candidate would not report a contribution in excess of the limit, right? Because they knew they shouldn't have taken it. They would only take the $2,500 contribution and not the $2,600 contribution. Um, but sort of how the question came about is, is this a violation of the municipal code where both the person giving the contribution and the person taking it as a candidate, would they be written into municipal court for a ticket? And that's not the way we would handle it. But anytime you make a violation in the code, the natural enforcement goes to code enforcement and municipal court. And so what we wanted to do, um, the, the existing language of the code did not provide for campaign finance um, reporting violations to, to send people to court. The guidance documents that we've adopted in accordance with our municipal code says it's civil penalties imposed by the clerk. So we just wanted to make that clear that any campaign finance violation um, would be enforced in the same way through the civil penalty assessment of the city and county clerk's office. Okay, and I, just one follow up question. So the, the practice that has been uh, thus far, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's complaint based. So if there's a complaint of a, a violation, then that goes to the clerk, and the clerk, uh, you know, reviews the information, I believe, and then moves forward with that violation. Um, is this cut out that complaint piece if the clerk's office uh, indeed sees that there's a violation? I I guess I wouldn't say that it's been 100% complaint based. I do believe um, penalties or warnings were imposed when someone was late without there being a complaint from outside our office. Um, so I wouldn't say it's 100% complaint based. In recent years, we have seen more scrutiny with people reviewing the reports once they come in um, and making complaints. But, but I would say still, if we've been in the practice of sending out reminders um, to try and keep everyone compliant, and um, as we move forward with more requirements, there are probably going to be less reminders just from an administrative perspective, the timing. Um, and so I think we will probably be taking role, a more of a role of enforcement before there are complaints, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. 
Um, I was going to hum Jeopardy, but I don't want to put any pressure on my colleague. No, I think it's a good test if you can file a proper campaign finance report in a timely manner, and you're probably qualified to do this job. And if they need a couple more minutes, I will just put a plug in. You can see on our website that we have the I Voted sticker contest happening. So I don't know if any of you have seen that and voted. Um, we had a really big turnout this year. So we actually had to divide it up. This was the first year that we let um, primary school kids participate. And so I believe we have 12 from elementary and middle school um, competing. And then we have 24 entries from the high school level. So I'd encourage you all to go and vote. And um, as a promise to council member Schaff, you will be doing ranked cho choice voting of the stickers, picking your first, second, and third choice. So. Yes, um, Madam Mayor, could we, could we ask for a motion to table? Okay. Let the wastewater ordinance be heard, and then we can come back to this one after wastewater. I, I think that's fine. Um, Council Member Ward. Uh, I move to move the table yeah. this hearing until after. Um, uh, after well, uh, ordinance 2175 is. <laughs> move to table ordinance 2171. Until after um, public hearing of ordinance number 2175. All right. Do I need a second? Can I get a second? I'll second. Thank yeah. you, Councilmember Lansley. Uh, is all in, and are we discussing? Did you see anybody want to discuss? All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. No, this is good. Good catch. Um, the final item, but not really, under council business this evening is the public hearing and council's consideration on second and final reading of proposed ordinance number 2175, amending certain sections of chapter 13 through 28 of the Broomfield Municipal Code related to wastewater. I'll now declare the public hearing open and we'll follow the city standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Ms. Dahl is joining us again. We have all been in a, 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 so many conversations about wastewater lately um, and that infrastructure and all becoming resident experts after having become resident experts on oil and gas. So topics are now changing. Um, and Ms. Dahl, do you want to introduce um, that young man in the blue shirt that is sitting back there, please? Um, actually, I would like to introduce two gentlemen in blue shirts uh, in the back of the room. The first, the first one, um, and I, I do want to extend my appreciation to not only our staff <laughs> at Wastewater, but also our city attorney's office and the others that helped uh, create these regulations and amendments. Uh, so with me, I actually will let them introduce themselves in the world. Thank you. I'm uh, Ken Rutt, the uh, Wastewater Division Superintendent. Thank you. Well, Ken, I think you started when you were, um, you started with me, so we were, what, 10, I think. Yeah, 9 and 10. Yeah. yeah. Ken, how long have you been here? A little over 34 years. Wow. So when we talk about a, a resident expert and someone that brings such joy to all of us every day, we, we like to say, you know, he makes wastewater fun. <laughs> we sure appreciate you. Gotta have somebody. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Hello, I'm Dennis Rodriguez, Industrial Wastewater and Stormwater Administrator. Ms. Rodriguez, forgive me, I didn't see you sitting back there because I don't have my glasses on, so the blue was not as dark blue. It's good to see you too, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Hoffman and Mr. And I, again, I just wanted to echo that these are the resident experts. They are wonderful at what they do, and I would not be nearly as successful as I am leading this department without such a great team. Um, so again, my name is Kimberly Dahl. I'm the Director of Public Works, and these regulations that are before you tonight were first presented to you and adopted on first reading on March 29th, earlier this year. There have been no changes uh, since that first reading. This is the second reading and public hearing for this ordinance to be implemented 
to implement required regulatory uh, changes to our wastewater regulations. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of the Clean Water Act, the EPA provides regulations, and one of those is a national pretreatment program for wastewater. Uh, it's a cooperative effort between the federal level, the state level, the local level, and the regulatory program is meant to protect the quality of our water for our rivers and streams. The state also issues Broomfield a wastewater discharge permit. This establishes the uh, limits, the requirements, the regulations as far as what we need to do in our wastewater treatment processes. And what allows us to implement uh, those regulations is chapter 13-28 of our Broomfield Municipal Code titled Wastewater. Um, our, because it is a cooperative effort between the federal, state, and local level, our regulations must be in alignment with the federal and state regulations, which is a primary reason uh, that these are being brought for you this evening. Uh, next slide, please. The most recent update to this portion of the municipal code was completed in 2008. It was adopted by city council at that point. And recently the EPA has updated national pretreatment rules. So the proposed revisions to the code will bring it in alignment with the current federal regulations requirements, um, also with the state requirements. And also it, it helps honestly protect our wastewater systems, um, specifically the, the grease and oil regulations. Uh, to protect the grease from even coming into the system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that picture on the bottom left is a picture of our aeration basin. And basically what you see there is foam from all the grease and oil that comes into uh, our system. And grease is one of the most challenging things we have to treat. So as part of their work, they make sure that the picture on the left doesn't go to the picture on the right. Um, so the proposed changes were developed with the EPA review, and we also held two public hearings with our industrial users to review the changes. Um, each pre-treatment customer was provided a copy of the proposed ordinance, and feedback at those public meetings were positive. Um, again, the revisions include, uh, they're detailed in the memo, um, but basically it's a, a couple new permit categories which clarify existing language. Um, updating the language and, li and limits, as I mentioned, to match the federal and state requirements. Um, adding grease and oil hauler regulations. Uh, this was previously managed by the state and is now being managed by our team. This offers us a little bit better control than what we um, previously had because we have more information related to the manifests uh, for the disposal of that grease, making sure that uh, we do have compliance there. Um, and also it updates these to ensure that this program is self, self-sustaining and self-funded by the users themselves. Um, again, this is to bring our code in alignment with the regulatory requirements. And if this is adopted this evening, um, following public notice, the implementation of the code revisions will go into effect and we will engage with our industrial users uh, through communication and outreach and update our permits uh, as, as appropriate to incorporate all the new revisions. And with that, I am available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Dahl. Next is public comments. Are there any members of the public that have any comments about this item? Don't see any in person and none online. We'll move to council member questions next. Does any member of council have any questions? Council member Lynn? Um, thank you for answering my questions via email, whoever has provided those responses. Um, I did, on the question where I asked, are there many non-residents given disposal permits? So am I understanding that correctly, that these are, is that non-resident like in a commercial user, or is it non-resident like not within Broomfield? Not yeah. within Broomfield. Okay, I, I'm having trouble grasping why half of the Wastewater disposal permits are from outside the Well, um, I would presume that our fees are more reasonable than our neighbors. So, for example, on page four of the memo, 
Uh, we have a table that lists out the fees uh, for our proposed 2022 fees. And then we also compare a couple of our neighbors. Um, one of our neighbors we match, and one of them we are $20 less. And so that might be a reason why um, neighboring communities or, or neighboring residents um, might want to use our facility. So you did reassure me in the answer, though, that we're covering our costs because um, we don't want people taking advantage of our re allowing other non-residents to use our services. Correct. Uh, we ran a quick calculation and approximately 0.002% of the flows that are coming to our wastewater treatment facility are supplied by the RV waste station from those outside residents. Um, so it really doesn't have a huge impact, but we are making sure that we're covering the administrative burden of managing those uh, permits. Okay. And my second question came actually from ACES last night. Um, the um, analysis fees, um, there are now requirements to test for PFAPs. Is that correct? Yes, that is a mandate from the state. Um, to test for what they call forever chemicals. Um, and we are one of three, three right now in Colorado that are required to test for PFAS. Um, so we are working on what that looks like and what source identification um, requirements are going to be met. Was there a more specific question? Well, well that? just they, it was brought up random. Yeah, and, um, that I didn't see PFAS listed as a fee for analysis. And I thought, and I wasn't sure if it was still in the implementation stage or not. I thought the legislation had passed that it was a requirement. Yes, thank you for the clarification, Council Member Lev. In response to that, that's not specific to our industrial users. That is specific to our entire wastewater collection system. So that would not be included oh. in here, but yes. we are meeting that as part of our discharge permit requirements. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other council member questions? All right, there being no further comments, the public votes at NC. Council member Anderson. Okay, thank you. And uh, Council member Lynn's question, maybe just curiosity, you said that we were one of three municipalities tested for PFAS. Why? I'm three. going to turn that over to Ken because I know um, he can answer that better than I can. That's a good question. Um, there are uh, several factors. One is the state can only open a permit if it is currently within its current term. And so all three of the facilities that got it here in January have current permits. Uh, secondly, uh, they focused on facilities with current permits that have current permits. Uh, one of the big issues is the firewall, right, at airport facilities. And so Brookfield serves the Washington Corner Court, uh, Denver Metro, obviously DIA, and then uh, South Platte uh, Renewal Authority, which is the Wilton A Court. Uh, and so they, we were the first three. The state is in the process of adding additional facilities um, as their current as their permits become current. Thank you. That was all my questions. All right, cool. Any other council member questions? All right, next is Council's consideration of proposed ordinance number 2175. Will the clerk please read proposed ordinance number 2175 by title? 11C, public hearing, ordinance number 2175, amending certain sections of chapter 13-28 of the Broomfield Municipal Code related to waste water, second and final reading. Thank you. Is there a motion? Council Member Leslie? I'll move the title. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Ward? Uh, second. Thanks. Is there any discussion? All right. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Dahl. Thank you. And our fabulous public work staff. We're going to go back to the previous agenda item. Yeah. I believe we were still within within the time of the public hearing, so you can just reopen the public hearing. All right, let me give that a shot. 
And now declare the public hearing reopened. Does that work? <laughs> you need a I mean, officially, we should move from the table in second, but. Um, and Ms. Delaney, Lou, and Ms. Gilbert have a proposed suggestion to address the issue that Councilmember Marsh Fulton raised. Yes. Uh, Jake, if you could. Um, what we've actually done since the ordinance already had some um, minutes shown in red is we went outside to the hallway and came up with language that we think addresses the concern that Councilmember Marsh Fulton raised, which is say someone began their candidacy in April or May. Um, this language now would say that the July report shall also include any contributions and expenditures prior to the month of July during that election cycle. And so this would mean um, an election cycle ends 30 days after the election. So somebody up for re-election would basically be, be, be picking, did it happen within 30 days? Or if not, then it's, it would be considered part of their next campaign that they would then report the next July. So um, I believe this change would address your uh, the issue you raised, um, but we are here for any other questions and comments. Um, and I guess we probably shouldn't forget to close the public hearing. There was no public comment earlier, but uh, you'll probably have to ask again in my apartment. That's, that's the lawyer in our city county clerk. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Delaney Lou. All right, thank you. Then I guess we'll go to public comment now on this amendment. Does anyone have any comment? I don't see any online. One more call, public comment, going, going. Okay, no. Any council questions on this amendment? Questions? Yeah. Okay. Then um, do I just, do we have to make the motion for the amendment or as amended? Can we do it? So thank you for answering that question, Mayor, because as you all know, since I started, I've been trying to instill this amendment process. Um, and we talked to staff about the easy, easiest way to address the red language amendment that was presented to council tonight when staff sees something and, and wants to get it in the ordinance. Um, officially, I would ask somebody to make a motion to um, approve the, the two amendments that are listed in red. And then we can move forward to a discussion on the as amended ordinance. Okay. Can I get a motion for that? Council Member Ward. So would I just say aye? So that would be a motion to amend the two staff, a motion to amend the ordinance to add this two staff amendments. Okay, so I move to uh, amend the ordinance to add the two staff amendments. Thank you. May I have a second? Council Member Marshall Schultz? Second. All right, any discussion? Yeah, okay. Um, so, am I going to do just so all those in favor of approving the amendments? Yeah, thank you. All those in favor of approving the amendment? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So, we'll go back to proposed ordinance number 2171 as amended. Is there a motion? Council Member Ward. I move that ordinance number 2171 as amended be adopted. Thank you. Second. Anybody? Councilmember Cohen. Second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Um, yeah, wait. Oh, discussion. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead, Councilmember Marsh. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify one thing that was, I did text Nancy about. Um, it does say, um, 40870 does say, particularly in election cycle, no person shall make a contribution. And B says, if that person's contributions. I just want to clarify that, that that includes entities such as the home builders or a union or something like that. Yes, yes, the definition of person does. Citizens United. Um, okay. And then Councilor Cody. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to reiterate it. one major reason for this uh, amendment or this ordinance is that in the last election, by my calculation, over a third of Donated dollars came from 2% of the total number of contributors, which I think leads uh, is a good reason to adopt limits so that more people feel um, like they have a say, they can have influence and be part of the election cycle and not feel that um, if they don't have a great amount of affluence or can't give a great deal of money, they are somehow um, not invited to the party. And 
unlimited donations does disenfranchise some folks. And I think this ordinance would be a good step forward to encourage more people to get involved. Thank you. Any other discussion? Also more transparency. Who doesn't love that? All in favor? And any opposed? That passes unanimously. So get your hand up. Thank you. All right. So moving on. <laughs> no, the city. Next is the city and county attorney report. Ms. Rogers, do you have a report? No, thank you. Next is the city and county manager's report. Ms. Hoffman? I'm going to try to delay to see if we can actually get to 8 o'clock, but alas, <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem, no, I do not. <laughs> All right. Kevin Emberlin, you had a question? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, so we're in the middle of a red flag alert. Um, and um, we we had issued a demand letter on the um, fire and interchange to extraction at the end of March, and we received a response at the end of April. So um, some of my constituents are um, interested in knowing uh, what the status of that. Um, response is and what our response status is, and especially it comes to light when we have heightened alertness because of the red flag situations. I'm going to let my colleague take that answer. I'll first address the question of what's going on with the response. We are going through that response. As we, as we mentioned, I think when we were talking about the update to the risk management plan, it is just an update to a plan. Um, it is not amending the operator agreement. We, we still are working on that. But I think more importantly, and what actually will help address some of our residents' concerns about this and the issue, if, if Mindy, and it looks like Mindy might have stepped away, um, the oil and gas team has been in daily contact with extraction, with Civitas and their staff as we get these red flag warnings. In fact, we just had an email exchange earlier today with Clay Shuck just talking about the ongoing communication with extraction, despite the demand letter, despite what happened before, but about what are you doing today? Inspectors being on the ground today, checking on um, what's going on on the operation, um, making sure that all efforts are being taken to make it as safe as an oil and gas operation could be. Thank you. Thank you. Any other um, I just thought of something too. We should announce that we do have a, a candidate forum for the two finalists for the deputy city and county manager position on Thursday. Is this option? Um, yes, yes. Um, it's been a uh, it's been a very collaborative process, which is generally how our hiring goes from department heads on up. Um, if uh, some of the recent department heads were here, it's a laborious process. It's um, we do some pretty deep dives, um, not just with myself, but with uh, all the department heads. Um, we had lunch, we had interviews. Um, we are very uh, satisfied with the top two candidates. One is the current um, county manager in Jefferson County, um, an individual that I've known for uh, about five years now. He serves with me on the City County Managers Association. Uh, and I and I must say he was not looking. Uh, he was a shoulder tap, um, and so I, I I couldn't be more pleased that he is one of the top two. The other one is also a shoulder tap, um, Amy Edingers. Um, she has been around um, government for about as long as I have. Uh, she is right now the um, the deputy chief um, and president of uh, real estate at DIA. A little small community city. Um, she's got a vast experience. She was with the Hickenlooper administration, Hancock administration, um, and they tapped her to go to DIA. So two very different candidates, um, both of whom um, I look forward to uh, to having the community and council input. Um, on Thursday night, they're going to come for a tour. It's uh, always an uh, interesting process after you get through the grind to have a more informal setting. So we have uh, four of the key department heads 
Yeah, we'll be taking them on a tour. They'll come, they'll have a light dinner. Um, and then we will uh, move into uh, the community forum. Excellent. Thank you so much for the update. You bet. Thank you. And there is no legislative update or any business before the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority or the ERISA Local Improvement District Board of Directors this evening. And no special reports or requests for future action. So that concludes the items on this evening's agenda. Is there any other business to come before the council? There being no further business.